The fine gates and the portico gate lodge on the Turnpike Road north of Donneril Town mark the formal entrance to a great landscaped estate. At the time when the gates were erected, the last years of the 18th century or the first years of the 19th century, the long process of laying out the estate was complete and Donneril Park had been arranged in the shape that we see it today. The shape is of an estate where the guiding principles are beauty and the landlord's pleasure rather than utility or profit. The estate did have a practical dimension. As we will see, pleasure and profit went hand in hand, but beauty was the overriding consideration. Only a wealthy man living in fairly peaceful times could afford to set aside 400 acres of prime land for a landscaped park. The St. Ledger family, which created this park, could do so because of their extensive land holdings in North Munster. The income from these lands met the very considerable expense involved in laying out the estate and building and embellishing the country house, which is its focal point. The greater part of the work at Donneril was undertaken in the early 18th century. The fashion in landscape gardening was exemplified, if not largely formed, by the achievements of the English landscape architect, Lancelot Capability Brown. The immediate impression created is that nature, not man, has shaped this landscape. The success of this illusion requires great skill and judgment. The art that conceals art. The dominant effects are extended prospects of undulating grassland. Within these are artfully set single specimens or clusters of broadleaf trees, mainly oak, beech, lime and chestnut. Bordering the great meadows are fringe belts, vast planting of broadleaf trees, to give the illusion that the meadows are clearings in the middle of woodland. Fences are sunk into the ground to avoid obstruction of the view. In the hollows of the landscape, water is the important element, artificially diverted into canals, cascades and ponds and spanned by elegant stone bridges. Eighteenth-century gardening is seen to good effect at Donneray. The way through the park is along a system of avenues designed to show all the features to the best advantage. The main avenue at Donneril winds its way for a mile through the park on its way to the court. Of course, Donneril was not always like this, and we can better appreciate the scale of what has been achieved there if we know what it was like before the 18th century St. Ledger's. An Anglo-Norman family, the Sinans, were the power in this part of North Cork up to the end of the 16th century. They arrived in Ireland in 1172 as a company of bowmen in Strongbow's invasion force. They were at the zenith of their influence in 1402 when Mac William Sin and Moore built a castle at Donneril. However, the Sinans became embroiled in the Desmond Rebellion of 1579 to 1582 and their fortunes declined as a result. Some of their lands were confiscated and in 1636 they sold their lands at Donneril to Sir William St. Ledger, Lord President of Munster, for the sum of £300 sterling. The St. Ledgers belonged to the aristocracy of colonial administrators who rose to prominence under the Tudors and achieved fortune during the land confiscations of the late 16th and 17th centuries. We first hear of them in Ireland in 1537 when Sir Anthony St. Ledger was sent here 
by Henry VIII to oversee the dissolution of the monasteries. His grandson, Sir Wareham St. Ledger, was chief governor of Munster. In 1600, he fought in single combat with Hugh Maguire, Lord of Fermanagh, before the walls of Cork. Both of the combatants died from the wounds they received in this encounter. It was Wareham's son, Sir William St. Ledger, who bought Donneray from the Sinans. Prior to this transaction, he had been acquiring other holdings in North Cork and Tipperary, and his position was threatened by the grant in 1639 by Charles I of the black letter patent of Donnerale Estate. The St. Ledgers were to enjoy unbroken possession of Donnerale Park until 1969, when the Department of Lands took over the remnants of their estate. As well as being a thing of beauty, the weir also had a practical junction. By speeding up the flow of the river, it increased the oxygen supply in the water and made it better for fish. The river has been stocked with trout and salmon by the fisheries board. Two limestone bridges span the Obeg River to the front of the house. The stone footbridge near the weir was designed to be seen from the avenue. It is a complicated structure going at an angle to the canal over which it is built. Its two arches are slanted in the direction of the stream. The most elegant of the Donnerail bridges is the triple arch bridge on the main estate avenue. It is highly decorated on the upstream side, as this is the side that would be visible to a person travelling to and from the house. This is the third limestone bridge on the Donrail estate, and this one is called the Hunting Bridge. Water is the dominant feature of the hollows of Donnerail. Trees are clustered or massed on the heights. Most of the trees of Donnerail are very old. The estate is noted for its fine oaks. Groups of them can be seen at many points, but they appear most impressively on the slopes above Ladies Well Wood and at the wetland area. The focal point of the landscape at Donnerail, from which all the architects' splendid vistas radiate, is Donnerail Court. The date of the house is uncertain. Some architectural historians believe that the basement dates from the late 17th century and it is likely that some of the St. Ledgers had a house on the site of Donneril Court since the early 1690s. The first Viscount Donneril may have occupied the house shortly after he got married in 1690. The date 1725 over the porch would seem to refer to a major reconstruction of the house. This date has proved to be confusing because the most famous incident to occur at Donnerail Court in 1712. Elizabeth St. Ledger, the first Viscount daughter, eavesdropped on a meeting of Father's Masonic Lodge being held in the library. Elizabeth was sitting in an adjoining room and apparently overheard the proceedings through a chink in the brickwork which would indicate that the builders were working on the house at the time. She was discovered and, although women were excluded from Freemasonry, made to take the Masonic vows to preserve the Masonic secrets. 
she therefore became one of only three female Freemasons in history. The remodeling of the house in and around 1725 was commissioned by Elizabeth's brother, Hayes St. Ledger. It was he, also, who was responsible for the early 18th century landscaping of the park. The architect he implied was Isaac Rothery. Rothery designed a tall three-story house of seven bays, with a three-bay break front, blocked coins and crisply moulded window surrounds. This house closely resembles two other houses built by Rothery, Bones Court in Kildare in County Cork and Mount Livers in County Clare. Rothery also designed Newmarket Court in North Cork for Elizabeth's husband, Richard Aldworth. In 1805 there was a fire and this was followed by further remodeling of the house. The east or garden front was given two bows, and an orangery in Strawberry Hill Gothic style was added. The classical porch was built onto the front of the house later in the 19th century. Towards the end of the 19th century, the area just southwest of the line walk, above the large fish ponds, was enclosed to create a sanctuary for rare aquatic birds. Demoiselle, cranes and rias, emu like birds were kept there. The place is still known locally as the bird enclosure. These have long since vanished, but today one can see their replacement, another exotic species, the Japanese sika deer. Sika deer were first introduced to Ireland in 1860 by Lord Powers Court at County Wicklow. The fish ponds in Donneril Park are said to be the largest formal stretch of still water extant in Ireland. They were made before Donneril Court was built. There is also a herd of Calamia red deer resident in Donneril Park Estate. <laughs> 